grand hotel in the middle of nowhere. It was home to opera stars and Broadway impresarios, composers, writers, and baseball players. When they moved on, a gay bathhouse and a swingers club moved in. You can't tell by looking at it now, what with all the strollers and baby Bjorns, but the Ansonia has one hell of a story to tell. When they broke ground on the Ansonia in 1899, the Upper West Side was a desert of shanties and unpaved streets. But this man, William Stokes, had a vision. His hotel on the corner of Broadway and 73rd Street was going to be massive, monumental, a magnet for the rich and famous. 1,400 rooms, 340 suites, and a maze of pneumatic tubes that delivered messages to the hotel guests. The exterior was decorated with intricate metalwork and copper cartouches. In the basement was an opulent indoor pool. And on the roof, a farm with 500 chickens, a half dozen goats, twice as many ducks, and a small bear. But for all its flair, the Ansonia never attracted the Tony crowd William Stokes had hoped for. Instead, artists, bohemians, and crooks called it home. The Metropolitan Opera made it their unofficial dormitory, and soon the likes of Toscanini, Stravinsky, Rachmaninoff, and Enrico Caruso were living there. Babe Ruth took up residence when the Yankees bought his contract from the Red Sox, and every morning the great slugger could be seen getting a shave in the hotel lobby. But all this fame was eclipsed by scandal. Broadway impresario Florence Ziegfeld took a ninth floor suite with his wife, the stunning Ziegfeld girl Anna Held, and another suite, one floor up, for his equally voluptuous mistress, Lillian Lorraine. In 1919, a group of White Sox players met at the Ansonia and conspired to throw the World Series for $10,000 each. The guilty players were banned for life from the game. This was definitely not the Blue Blood set. The next decades were even harder. During the Depression, the building fell into disrepair. But it was World War II that really took its toll. The beautiful metalwork was stripped for bullets and tanks, and the ornamental copper pulled out and melted down. By the 1950s, the pipes were rusted, the roof leaked, and balconies were being held up with wire. Then, the gays moved in. In 1968, a former opera singer named Steve Ostro rented the long-abandoned swimming pool. Ostro wanted a gay bathhouse reminiscent of the glory of ancient Rome. Well, almost. The Continental Baths had palm trees, a waterfall, and vending machines that dispensed KY jelly. It also had Bette Midler and Barry Manilow. Word soon got out. On Saturday night, the line snaked around the block. Gay men in bath towels mingled with straight couples dressed to the nines. It was Studio 54, before there was a Studio 54. Eventually, the gay crowd abandoned the Continental and moved on to a more hardcore scene downtown, which is ironic given what took its place. In what had once been William Stokes' grand basement, a club called Plato's Retreat opened. Mattresses lined the orgy rooms, and swingers, porn stars, and dentists from New Rochelle acted out the sexual revolution. After a brush with fame in the early 90s, as the location for a single white female, the Ansonia went condo. One bedroom apartment sold to insiders for $125,000. Today, the same place would cost you well over a million. William Stokes' vision had finally been realized. <laughs>